Good morning. I hope you're having a blessed, blessed Tuesday. And um, where I'm at in the deep south, the sun is shining. Yesterday, for the first time in nine or ten days, my mother and I were able to speak with uh, my father. And uh, he continues to need strength for recovery. I'm very, very thankful for the goodness of God. The Lord has been so very good to all of us. I realize that this particular venue draws quite a number of people who are not in Greene County and don't live in Springfield. And uh, with that in mind, I'm asking for those of you from elsewhere to kind of lend the weight of your prayer uh, toward uh, our community. And I realize that your community certainly needs prayer as well. But uh, what I would ask you to pray for, and you don't have to spend hours on this unless God just directs you, is that there would be a great harvest and great revelation. Our community has an abundance of fear. Uh, and I've taught and preached about the spirit of Antichrist, and the spirit of Antichrist really is not one who expels Christ, and except in the sense that it dispossesses the anointed one. It dispossesses the power of the anointed one. And in our community, we have fear, and people are having their desire for the spiritual things dispossessed by their prosperity and possessions and of course, there is a significant amount of falsehood as well. Every city has key people. Every moment in time has key people as well. And so I would ask you to join us in praying that uh, those key men and women would find God. I appreciate those who've joined me each day, and uh, this is stretching me. Of course, the material that I'm teaching is part of a home Bible study that I have taught many, many times, so but I'm adding quite a bit to it as well. Right now, and this started, I believe, on Friday, we started talking about salvation and what it meant to be saved. And I'm not going to repeat everything that I've said, except to remind you that, uh, number one, I don't perceive myself as having all the answers. There's much that I don't know about the Word of God. Secondly, I welcome any question as long as I can say I don't know. And number three, I will always use the Scripture within context. If I don't, I will so note it. And that should be your expectation of every single fellow you hear preach the Word of God. A Scripture used out of its normal context is nothing but a pretext. If we use the Word of God in that way, we can basically make it say anything that we want to. But what does this idea of being saved, what does it mean? And uh, when we uh, look at it all, the Greek word soteria, uh, which, is, uh, which is the idea of being saved, uh, it, it, um, it includes in it the idea of an instant and immediate salvation for those who meet the qualifications, for those who do the things that God asks them to do. Do we need salvation? Sure we do. All of us are rebels. We are, we are men and women who make bad choices, even when we know those things are not particularly what would be pleasing to God. And the book of Romans says this is true of all of us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So salvation is certainly needed. Salvation is needed by every one of us. As we got into it, we began to talk about the different things the Bible says about salvation. And I really had never uh, looked at it quite to the degree that I have in any home Bible study that I've taught, mainly because of not having the time to do so. But I'll just run quickly over the things we've talked about. James 1 and 21, we receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. This refers to the word of God being grafted into the wild root and the wild trunk of our life. And through it, we are saved. 
Okay, the second thing, and I'm having fun with my iPad today, it keeps moving where I don't want it to go. The second thing is that whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved, and that is found in Proverbs 28 and 18. And it really is speaking to the idea that if we can walk without uh, crouching, trying to hide because of our behavior, we are men and women who are walking uprightly. In Luke 7, 36 through 50, Jesus encounters a woman who is known to be a sinner, and she hears him say, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. And again, we spent quite a bit of time on each of these accounts. Go back and look at them uh, in, our earlier, in our earlier sessions. In uh, Acts 11 and 14, Simon Peter is giving an explanation about him being at Cornelius' house and what Cornelius heard an angel say, who shall tell the words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. We need the preaching of the word of God. We need the salvation message preached into our life. Jesus said in uh, John 10 and 9, adding further to the weight of what the Bible says about being saved, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. And so the emphasis is on, of course, entering the door, which is Christ Jesus. And in him, we have salvation. And uh, then yesterday, I talked with you a bit from the book of Isaiah, that if we will look to God, that he will save us. And finally, we moved over, and that was in Isaiah 45 and 22. Then we went into the book of Acts, where that, Simon, where that Paul and Silas have come to Philippi, and um, they have been uh, arrested. And of course, yesterday I spent more time kind of in, in lead up, specifically because I felt the Holy Ghost wanted me to address particular things that, that uh, are or spiritual in context, and if you don't understand, just go and listen. So anyway, they have preached in Philippi, and then they are arrested because they have cast an unclean spirit out of a young lady, and uh, she had had a spirit of divination. She could tell people what their future was going to be. She made money for the people who owned her as a slave. Well, when that spirit of divination was gone, so was her ability to tell people the, the future. Well, the, the, the people who owned the slave girl who had the spirit of divination raised up such a ruckus that, that Paul and Silas were arrested. They were accused of bringing uh, insurrection into the city of Philippi, that they were teaching and speaking things that were contrary to the Roman government. And so, uh, of course, uh, all of these various provinces of Rome wanted to keep that sort of thing away. So Paul and Silas were beaten and they were beaten severely. Many stripes were put on their back. And uh, after being beaten, they were put in prison. In the prison, they were put in the inner, uh, in the inner cell, they were locked there in stocks. The prison keeper was not uh, kind to them at all, and I ended kind of on the note of God delivering them, God saving them from their situation, because uh, as they prayed and sang praises at midnight, there was an earthquake. And uh, of course, as I read all of this stuff in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, I, I kind of have to ask myself at times, does anybody really believe this book? Does anybody believe this stuff? And uh, if we do believe it, why would the why would any of us relegate this same God into an absentee, powerless Lord? Uh, J. B. Phillips, who is now deceased, wrote a book many years ago. Our God is too small. Well, it can be that way. So when the prison doors are open, the prison keeper assumes that all have escaped, and since he is accountable for keeping them secure. He contemplates taking his own life. And in response to this, Paul and Silas say to him, uh, they, they say to him, do yourself no harm. Or Paul says, do thyself no harm. We are all here. And he comes to them 
And he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I just love that question. And in verse 31, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Okay, so now they have given him an answer. He is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it goes from there. Verse 32 says, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to the all that were in his house. Now, they have given him a capsule. They have given him a nugget. You are to believe. What must I do to be, saved, to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now they are going to speak to him the word of the Lord and to all of the people that were in his house. So what's this business of them speaking to him the word of the Lord? They have told him what to do, and then they are going to tell him why he is to do this. You see, the, the, the individual that Paul and Silas are dealing with was not a Jew. He had no background in Hebrew scriptures. He was a foreign man living in a foreign city. He may well have had uh, some connections to Rome. He simply knew nothing about the promise of the Messiah. And so Paul and Silas do not just ask him to make a decision, but instead they tell him what he needs to do, and then they tell him, they explain to him why he's to do this. Paul and Silas were not asking him to make an uninformed decision. They spake to him the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord would be the basis of this prison keeper believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you suppose he believed? Sure he did. Sure he did. What do we see uh, happen as a result of this? He doesn't reattach these men to their prison stocks. Instead, there's a change of behavior in him. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. He changed his behavior. Now, uh, that's a phrase that we understand the Bible word for that phrase that we don't use often in normal terminology, we use it in church terminology, but you don't hear many people at the grocery talking where that they use the word repent. But this man heard the word of God. He believed on the basis of what he heard. And again, what he heard, even the opportunity for him to hear this is based on what he had experienced earlier, an earthquake, and these men not escaping as a result of that earthquake. So now he's believed, he has a change of behavior, and he was baptized. He believed. Now all they've said is believe. But his belief and his hearing the word of God caused him to desire to be baptized, he and all his straight way. And when he had brought them into his house, and this is what salvation does for us, not only did he set meat before them, but he rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Think about, I had a young man tell me some months ago of his own a quest for suicide, of standing in his yard with gun in hand, anticipating taking his own life. And when he, when he pulled the trigger, the gun misfired. Here's a man who has contemplated exactly that because his life is going to, I mean, he, the Roman government's going to do him in. He has lost the prisoners that were at his charge. But asking Paul and Silas the right question, what must I do to be saved? You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hearing that, and then hearing the word of the Lord concerning the Messiah and concerning salvation, 
He reflects on what they say. He believes now, not just that there's been an earthquake, not that there's just been a miracle. He believes the word of God. And the word of God that he believes causes him to desire to be baptized. When he is baptized, he comes back to his house rejoicing, believing in God with all his house. Just just at moments before, perhaps 90 minutes, two hours, three hours, I don't know how long it took them to explain to this man about how to be saved, but however long it took, he enters into this situation with fear, trepidation, uncertainty, and having been recently suicidal. But when he gets through hearing the word of God, when he gets through having been baptized, this man is sitting in his house rejoicing. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, yes. But in the context of what he hears, or maybe not but, but in the context of what he hears, he believes and then he acts. Does, does that make sense to anybody but me today? Um, kind of like the fellow who his first adventure into, into preaching online was about this time last week, and he looked at his audience and said, which was an empty building, and said, well, uh, today I can't get a witness. I can't get an amen from anybody in the house because there's nobody in the house. Okay, now I want to take us to another portion of Scripture that addresses this premise of salvation. Um, again, my iPad is having fun with me today. Um, the verse of scripture that I want to refer you to this morning comes from the epistle of 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 21, and I draw it out of its context, then we're going to go back and talk about the context. He says to his audience, even baptism doth also now save us. In our previous uh, discussion of a portion of Scripture that dealt with salvation, we observed a man being baptized. Peter is talking now about the significance of baptism. From Peter's introduction of this particular little letter, we, we know that this letter was originally written uh, for Gentile saints who were scattered around an area that is now part of Turkey. And I, as I say so often, it's important to know who's writing, who's speaking. It's important to know who they write to. It's important to know who they speak to because this letter has specific information for this group of people. Peter's going to help them as they are dealing with persecution. They're under huge stress. And in the epistle, he reminds them that Christ also suffered, except that Jesus did not deserve to suffer. And then he is going to bring them in the portion of Scripture that we uh, have just kind of drawn out of its place, where Peter takes us back to Noah and the ark. And those who know about the uh, Bible a bit, know that Noah and his ark saved eight people. That's not many people out of the population that would have been on the earth at that time. But when we look at that verse of scripture, most of us focus on the ark, but really the way it's written, what Peter intended to say to them was to give emphasis to the water because the water lifted up the ark and the people within that ark were taken above the ruin of sin and the judgment of God. So the water that became an, in, an instrument of destruction on the ground because of men and women's unrighteousness lifted Noah above that unrighteousness and above 
that judgment of God. When Noah and his family have been saved without the ark, Peter's kind of bemoaning here that only eight people were saved and Noah having obeyed God and building the ark and getting inside and, and, uh, and, and being lifted up. But then he draws a direct comparison between the water that lifted the ark, saving Noah and his family. He draws a direct comparison, and he says it this way, the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also save us now, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. And so he's making clear that when we're baptized, it's not simply getting in a river or getting in a baptismal tank and the human body being made clean. So it's not the putting away of the filthiness of the flesh, but instead it is the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This evening, Pastor Butler will be baptizing uh, at uh in the baptistry of the church that we're currently renting from. Social distancing will be maintained. We'll have a maximum of 10 in all of the groups. And I'm sure that those who will be baptized will kind of have to do it in shifts in the building even to maintain all of that. But now here we are in a moment of huge stress for the world. Why would someone desire such a thing. Why would anybody desire to be baptized? Well, let's go back to what Peter said. And again, I'm not drawing this from context. I'm emphasizing the context, the light figure, the water lifting the ark, taking Noah and his family above the unrighteousness and the judgment for that unrighteousness. In the light figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. That's why these folk will be baptized. Was Peter moved by the Holy Spirit to write those words? All scripture is given the inspiration of God. So Peter seems to indicate, unless I miss something here, and, and again, the scripture has to be looked at as a whole. We don't get to pick and choose our portions regarding salvation. We also don't get to pick and choose how we examine the scripture in regard to its contextual use. We have to be consistent in this. If we believe that Peter was moved by the Holy Spirit to write these words, it seems that he is indicating there is a value in baptism. Now, we've talked about quite a few things uh, through this time. And by the way, if you're interested in knowing more about being baptized, if you'll send a note to me below, or if you will send a private message, or if you will somehow get in contact via email, church phone number, which by the way, we now have a live phone number through Google Phones, and it will come on to my phone. If you're interested in that, uh, make inquiry. We have people who would love to teach you a personal Bible study. You see, it's kind of like Paul and Silas dealing with that prison keeper. We want to make sure that you know what you're getting into and that you really understand that Jesus is the Messiah. So we've talked about quite a number of things that will save us. Just as walking uprightly found in the book of Proverbs won't save a person because there are a lot of people who know absolutely nothing about Jesus. They know nothing about the scripture. Uh, they may have a, a background in, in Hinduism or Buddhism or any number of things, but they, they walk with integrity. There are people who are in various cults around our community who live with great integrity. They, they walk uprightly. They are not dishonest. You can do business with them and trust the outcome. They walk uprightly. But 
would we say of such a person that that individual is saved simply because they walk uprightly? Well, most Bible believers would certainly say that they're walking uprightly is not enough to save them, and neither will the obedient act of baptism alone save us. Now, I want you to put that in a context of everything that I've taught because it's important, but it brings us back to a question. Is there anything in all of this list of saved verses that we should exclude from our consideration? Okay, so Simon Peter. Now, we're going to look at uh, another portion of Scripture where that Peter is the speaker. This is found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. And it's kind of an interesting uh, statement. Peter says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. And so the emphasis here is on saving yourself. The drowning girl who I've referenced in some of these lessons, she can't save herself the couple whose marriage is in steep decline and they simply don't know what to do. They need counsel in order to save their marriage. They can't save it themselves. So what is Peter talking about when he says, save yourselves from this untoward generation? Now, if you'll go read all of this, this is toward the end of Simon Peter's message that launches the New Testament church. Uh, and, and to get there, we kind of need a recap of what happens in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. Jesus has been resurrected. He spends a significant amount of time with his disciples, and uh, he has instructed them on their behavior. As part of that instruction, he tells them that they're to go to Jerusalem, and they're to wait there for the promise of the Spirit. So as Jesus is telling them this, he ascends into heaven. This kind of mystifies the disciples. They have to be prompted by angels to go on to Jerusalem and wait for the promise that they've been given. They go to Jerusalem, and they enter into prayer. Well, while they're in prayer, they also transact the business of selecting a replacement for Judas Iscariot, our, our church in normal times, has a monthly prayer chain. This prayer meeting, I probably have folks who don't much care for us doing that, but this particular prayer meeting was not like that prayer chain where people volunteer to pray for an hour on that select Sunday. This prayer meeting lasted for at least seven days. I've seen people in response to the coronavirus talking about a minute prayer, and, and all prayer is important, all prayer is helpful, and most of us can't shut down today and go into a seven-day prayer meeting. But these folk, they go into days of prayer. And so now here they are, imagine them, they're cloistered in this upper room, and uh, there's over a hundred of them in that room. While they are there, the city of Jerusalem is beginning to feel the effects of an upcoming feast. The upcoming feast was known as the Feast of Pentecost, and this was something that uh, Hebrew people were encouraged to attend. And so thousands upon thousands of people came to this annual feast. The city of Jerusalem burgeoned in its population, where there were actually several hundred thousand people there for the Feast of Pentecost. The word Pentecost is called that because the, the, the Feast of Pentecost happened 50 days after the Passover. The Passover uh, was a great event in Israel having been delivered from Egyptian slavery. I'll let you read about the Passover for yourself in the book of Exodus. But on the night of the Passover, the death angel passed over the homes of the Israelites that had properly prepared. So the Lord has passed over them in judgment, and he has helped them to pass over the Red Sea. Fifty days later, Moses 
is up on Mount Sinai, and God gives him the law. And so this Passover and now Pentecost, 50 days later, are very important dates in Jewish history. So the word Pentecost and the phrase the day of Pentecost originally had nothing to do with a church name, nor did it have to do with an experience associated with this particular day. It was a feast 50 days after the Passover. In time, for the Hebrews, Pentecost had come to be known also as the celebration of the first fruits. They would bring a small portion of their harvest to celebrate and rejoice and to be thankful that there was going to be a great harvest. So see the picture, 120 in this upper room, the city of Jerusalem filled with people who are there for the Feast of Pentecost. And so the day of Pentecost finally arrives. These people are in prayer. Those in this room were filled with the Spirit. Some of the people who had come to Jerusalem gathered, the, the, the book of Acts calls it a multitude. And these onlookers that day were confounded by what they were seeing because they were hearing these people speak words of praise about the Lord Jesus Christ in their own language. And this amazed them, this mystified them, it astounded them. So they were confounded and some were even critical. Questions were asked. People cast aspersions on their behavior saying, these are drunk even at nine o'clock in the morning. In response to their questions, Simon Peter steps to the forefront and he uses Old Testament scripture to declare that Jesus is the Messiah and that what is seen in front of them that day is the fulfillment of a prophecy given by Joel many centuries earlier. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. That's not the only time he quotes the Old Testament. Matter of fact, uh, much of Peter's sermon that day takes people back to the Old Testament where he either directly quotes a verse of scripture or he makes an allusion to an Old Testament scripture. Well, Peter's preaching that day was emphatic. He ends with an indictment of some of the recent actions that had happened with the crucifixion of Christ. And I, I imagine him, and I don't know, I just, Peter was, uh, Peter was impulsive. Uh, Peter, I, I just imagine Peter is just kind of always being on the edge of expressing himself in a pretty assertive way. I see him with red hair, and I don't know if he had red hair, but I see him with his finger pointed at that multitude of people saying that God has made this same Jesus who you crucified both Lord and Christ. Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Messiah. And he said, you crucified him. Well, that's, that's a pretty strong indictment that he has given to them. And so the group asked, and I'm, I'm, paraphrasing, uh, we're guilty, we're terribly guilty of conspiracy to commit murder. What do we need to do? Is there any remedy for us in our sinful condition? And Peter gives them some very uh, succinct directions, and you can find that uh, in reading Acts chapter 2. If you're unfamiliar with it, why don't you read the Bible either online or go find your Bible if you don't have it in hand today, and just read Acts 2, and then uh, send me a note, and people in the audience a note, as to what Peter instructed these conspirators to murder to do. So now we come to where we started this. In part of Simon Peter's concluding thought to this group of people, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Again, 
the untoward generation idea uh, is not very familiar with, to us. Um, some current translations use this phrase, uh, save yourself from a generation that is lacking direction. Well, if we just pull that out of its context, I would imagine that somehow by my own bootstraps, I could pull myself up to salvation. But you read all of it. You read everything that precedes it. You come to understand what surrounds it. Save yourselves. It doesn't mean that I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps. In the spiritual and eternal realm, I cannot save myself, neither can any of you. You may have tried to save yourself, but it hadn't worked well. It may have been as simple as, I'm going to stop cursing. But those old ingrained habits can be hard to beat. It may be that you've tried to go cold turkey and beat addiction or lying or sexual sin but you haven't been able to manage it. So what is Peter saying to this group of people and by extension to me as I realize that I cannot save myself from this untoward generation? Well, I think the way he describes his generation is a very fitting description for where we're living in today. Uh, we're part of a generation that before there was a coronavirus had little direction, if any, and that was the case whether we were on Wall Street, on the steps of the White House, the Capitol Hill, or the steps of the Supreme Court, as well as in Mecca or any of the other great places of various religions, including Jerusalem. A generation without direction. Save yourself from this. Okay, yeah, but, but, but how? If we had been there today, that day to ask Peter, he would have said, well, save yourselves from this underwar generation by carrying out the instructions already given to you. It seems clear that as Peter preached that day that his audience had come to believe that Jesus was the Christ, that uh, he was their hope for Messiah. When this mental dialogue began between Peter and the multitude of people, this audience was not convinced. They were not convinced at all. They were not convinced by the confusing things that they saw happen on the day of Pentecost. They were confused, they were curious, and they were critical, but they were not convinced. But when Peter got through sharing with them the word of God, the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and the outpouring of the Spirit that are found in this book, they were convinced. By the way, that's where we need to get most of our questions answered is in the book the book, God's Word. Well, as Peter preached to them that day, the light bulb came on. I love to have people uh, where the light bulb comes on as they listen. They have a revelation of who Jesus is. They understand that he's the Messiah. But now they come with this question, what shall we do? They're believing in Jesus to be the Messiah, and they're saving themselves from this generation that lacked direction. Seems to be connected to specific behaviors on their part. They, the fact that they asked Peter, what shall we do, is in their own way a mental assent, an amen to what Peter has said to them. They have come to trust, they have come to believe and to have faith that Jesus was the Messiah. 
But an interesting question. Is belief in Jesus as the Messiah, the anointed one, God manifest in flesh, the one who breaks the yokes of human bondage, is that ever expressed without meaningful and definitive action by the believer? Okay, now, the only church history that we really have that is inspired of God is found in the book of Acts. Everything from that point forward is either epistles or it is prophecy. But in this particular setting, we have behavior associated with the New Testament church. They were to save themselves. Their belief led them to action. Maybe you've always believed that Jesus was, but you've never acted on that belief. I run into people so often that I believe in Jesus, but I've really never done anything about it. Well, follow Peter's instruction. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And by the way, when the coronavirus fright has come to an end and life has returned to some degree of normalcy, our generation will still be a generation without direction unless it enters into a relationship, unless men and women enter into their personal relationship and their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an old song that says, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Just now, there are people who are saying, Lord Jesus, I need thee. This hour, I need thee. But we need to back up from that. I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Thank you for joining me today. If you're interested in a personal Bible study with uh, myself or one of our other trained teachers, um, if you have children that you'd love to have taught, uh, we have received inquiries about Bible studies almost every day of the teaching, and I'm thankful for that. Let me pray for you. Father, our world is certainly an untoward generation, and there's an abundance of fear. Pray for those who listened yesterday, and they're, they're, they're in that moment of opportunity to seek you. And then I pray for those who this will be the day that they see yesterday's material. And, and uh, God, would you help them to take hold of that moment? God, for those who are confused today and they're cautious today and they're critical of so much about life today, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that the Holy Ghost would commission ministering spirits, angels, just as you did to Cornelius' house, to give good men and good women direction as to what the next steps should be in their life. God, it's a stressful time, and we pray for divine healing in regard to the coronavirus. We pray protection on our families. We pray for families that we are acquainted with who have lost loved ones already to this dread condition. But God, in the midst of this, there is a sweeping harvest of people who realize, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Jesus, move in your unique way. This is about all I can do right now, but the Holy Ghost can do so much more. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All things going well. I'll be back with you tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock. And uh, by the way, if any of you are interested in the notes that I'm teaching from, uh, if you will uh, send me a a personal message, private message, or even a message below. I'll be glad to send these to you. Thank you to our church family who are holding all of this up. I appreciate you so very much. I'm looking forward to hanging out with you. When this is over, we're going to have a celebration, not just a celebration because we all get to be back together. We're going to celebrate about what God has done 
in what is a difficult time for this world. In Jesus' name, and I will see you tomorrow.